Okay, welcome to lecture number six for ECE 376 Embedded Systems, LEDs. Now, LEDs are just terrific devices. They're bright, they're shiny, they're pretty. Uh, stuff that you can control with a microprocessor. Today we're going to look at how do you drive an LED with a microprocessor. And with some programs, you can build an LED flashlight that varies the color with an RGB LED. You can have eight LEDs connected to your flashlight and turn them off sequentially. So you have a very bright flashlight with eight lights on or a dim flashlight with only one light on. You can build a strobe light. Uh, various things you can do with LEDs. They're a simple way to get binary inputs and outputs. They're extremely fast. They convert current to light. Um, generally all, all around useful devices. The thing I remember about LEDs is their diodes, light emitting diodes. Diodes only allow current to flow one way. So it does matter how you connect them. A uh, bit of background on diodes. The VI characteristics for a diode are nonlinear. That makes analysis hard. As they increase the voltage across the diode, nothing happens, nothing happens, nothing happens. Then suddenly get current flow. That's just how diodes work. Uh, likewise for LEDs. The way we design and analyze diodes is we assume an ideal diode. What an ideal diode is, is I assume that the voltage drop is constant if there's current flow. That's not exactly true, but it gets you pretty close. If you want to get more accurate results, you build the circuit in lab. Or you simulate in part sim, circuit lab. The way diodes are specified is typically like this. Um, you have the LED, the color, the current, typical VF, typical mill candles. The color is a non-scientific term. That's your red LED, green blue LED, blue LED. The wavelength is actually much more accurate. This is a more precise way of defining the color of the LEDs. And LEDs are actually very narrow bandwidth. When it says 630 nan nanometers, it's probably something like 625 to 635. Very narrow window. That also makes the color LEDs kind of pretty. If you have quilts, you can take the different color LEDs and show them on the quilts, and they look different under red light versus green light and blue light. You can also mix the colors and make any color. Uh, humans only see three colors, red, green, blue. The other colors are mixtures of those three. Um, if we go with other species, like uh, birds, birds see four colors, dogs see two colors, cats. Uh, well, you really can't tell with cats because they don't do testing very well. Um, but that's the RGB LEDs. Um, there's also a white LED in a, both one watt and half watt that are up in the lab. The wavelength against the color, the brightness is how bright they are. A candle is a standard beeswax candle. It's kind of a non-scientific term for brightness, but one candle is actually fairly bright. What Splunkers used to do is you take a candle and stick it inside a metal bucket. Then you can take the metal bucket and point it around the room, and that's your spotlight. You can sit there and see around a cave. So one candle is enough to see in the dark with caves. 8,000 metal candles is the brightness of eight standard beeswax candles. When you get brighter, the unit changes to lumens. Again, lumen is a perceived brightness. Uh, again, kind of hard exactly to find. Kind of give it uh, a thousand lumens is a hundred watt light bulb. Give an idea of perspective. The voltage drop comes back from the VI characteristic. They're trying to specify a nonlinear curve with a single point. So what they typically do is pick some current. That'll tell you what the voltage is at that one point. And if the current varies, the voltage does vary. Assuming an ideal diode, the voltage will be roughly constant for any current flow. So this says for a white star LED, the voltage drop is roughly 3.4 volts for any current. A red LED is roughly 1.8 volts for any current. And the current is the current that corresponds to the lumens and the VF. Current is light. If I have the current, I'm going to have the brightness. Voltage stays constant though. So that's kind of how LEDs are specified. The circuit to connect a PIC to an LED is kind of two different ones. If I need less than 5 volts, less than 25 milliamps, just connect the LED directly through a resistor. Uh, for example, for red LED, this is a 1.9 volt drop. If I output 5 volts, I can't do 5 volts directly across the LED because then you have a fight. The PIC says 5 volts, the LED says 1.9. Whoever's got the biggest fuse wins. The resistor saves the pick. It also specifies the current. So if I have the difference, 3.1 volts across R, I can pick R to set the current. 
Uh, second circuit, if I need more than 5 volts or more than 25 milliamps, use a transistor. And we'll look at both of those in the following lecture. The first one is, suppose I just want to drive an LED directly. If I have a red LED that uses or drops 1.8 volts to 20 milliamps, and I want to output 5,000 millicandles to it, what I do is first design the hardware, then the software. On the hardware, to set the brightness to 5,000 millicandles, if 8,000 millicandles is 20 milliamps, 5 eighths of that is 5,000 millicandles. So I want to push 12.5 milliamps through the diode, meaning the resistor that I want should be the difference 3.2 volts at 12.5 milliamps to 56 ohms. Build this circuit, I'll push 12.5 milliamps through that diode. An example of using LEDs with a direct connection would be a Prana RGB LED. Uh, these are RGB LEDs in a single package. This is like a single pixel on a scoreboard. It's got four leads with three LEDs. There's a common, in this case, this is the common cathode. That'll go to ground. The anode is connected to your pick board through a resistor. By picking the resistor, I can set the brightness of each LED. These are rated at 20 milliamps, so I picked the red, green, and blue to drive 20 milliamps through it. So first specify the resistors. Uh, for 20 milliamps, the voltage drop across the LED is 1.8 volts for red, 3 volts for green and blue. I want the resistors to be 160 ohms, 100 ohms, and 100 ohms. Okay, that's the hardware side. I'll then connect them to your pick board. And currently notice that I've got the cathode connected to ground. The other three are connected straight to your pick board using three resistors. And I'm using port B right now. There is no software. Port B is an input. So if I turn on RB0, the blue light turns on. RB1, uh, that LED is burnt out on this <coughs> piranha. And RB3 turns red. So you get the blue, green, assuming it was working, and red. That first check to make sure that your LED works. Uh, now let's write some code. I want to write some code and turn the pick into an LED flashlight. So I'm put RB0, the lights turn off, red light, light turns on, then green, then blue. The way you do that is through software import C. Notice these lights can be tied to the RGB LED. I'll move it over now to port C. And when I hit RB0, the lights turn off. RB1 turns on port C pin 0, RB2 turns on port C pin 2, and RB3 turns on port C pin 3. And when you get us a flashlight, this makes it red, this makes it off, and it looks like my LED just burned out. Okay, the red light works at least. Now you can see on the pick, uh, the different lights are turning on. That'll turn on the red, green, blue. The way you do that in software is as follows. I'm going to have port C as my output. Color is a variable that specifies which pins are turned on. And so when I start the loop, I'll first initialize everybody to output, port B is input, port C is output. I'll move color to W, and then move W back to color. So basically nothing changes, and then move color to port C. Inside the loop, if I hit a button, I'm going to change what W is. So move color to W, then check. If port B pin 0 is pushed, I'll replace W with a 0. If port B pin 1 is pushed, I'll replace it with a 1, or 2, or 3, or 2, or 4. And that gives you this pattern right here. On 0, I output 0 port to port C. On 1, I output 1, 2, 4. And that's the different bit patterns. And that gives you the three different colors. What you can do, a good homework problem, is change this so that I now have a seven color flashlight. If you mix the colors, like red plus green makes teal, red plus blue makes, no, red plus blue makes teal, red plus green makes yellow, uh, green plus blue makes teal, something like that. There's magenta in there somewhere. I can get the different colors. Mix red plus green plus blue all together, I get white. Uh, conceivably, I could actually have seven different colors plus off. 
another option is make this the flashlight where the brightness get bright, gets uh, varies with the button I push. So I could change these numbers to have a single LED turn on, two LEDs, three LEDs, four LEDs. As the more, more LEDs turn on, I get a brighter flashlight. So that's one idea. If I need less than uh, five volts, less than 20 milliamps, just connect the LED directly to the pick chip through a resistor. If I need more power, I can use the transistor as a switch. What a transistor does is access an electronic switch. It takes something wimpy like a pick processor, capable of 25 milliamps, and makes it more powerful, capable of driving, say, up to 4 amps. The way a transistor works is it's an NPN device. That's the ones we're using are NPNs. Collector to emitter is a reverse bias diode, so there's no current flow. Base to emitter is a PN junction. That's a diode. If I apply current base to emitter, I have holes flowing from the base to the emitter. Uh, for every hole, there's an electron. The base is really, really thin, so the electron shoots right through the base and winds up at the collector. What that gives me is a current control current device. I can control the current emitter to collector through the base current. And actually, since electrons are negative charged, this current is actually collector to emitter. So the base current controls the collector current. If I change the doping so that the emitter is doped 100 times the base uh, doping, for every electron or every hole, I get 100 electrons. That's your current gain. So for transistors, it saturates, or the collector current is beta IB. To act as a switch, if I allow more current flow than is possible, I'll saturate. And saturation just means this tries to go to zero. It won't quite get to zero volts. It'll clip or saturate about 0.2 volts. But that's what you want for a switch. When the switch closes, the voltage is zero, or in this case, about 0.2. The symbol for transistor is this. That arrow means diode. There's a diode between the base and the emitter. That's an NPN transistor. The model for it is base to emitter is a diode. Collector to emitter is a current control current source. This base current controls the collector current. And there's also amplification. This is beta IB. The transistors you use depend upon what you have available. Uh, we used to have, we usually have the 3904 and TIP112s in stock. The 3904s I like because they're 3.7 cents each. They're really cheap. Uh, we print out a lot of transistors and at 3.7 cents each, we don't really care. The limitation of the 3904 is it only is good for uh, 200 milliamps. And if I want more current, I need to switch over the TIP transistor. This is capable of up to 4 amps, but it's more expensive, 59 cents each. If I want to do something like drive a 1 watt LED, a 1 watt LED draws, I think, 300 milliamps. If I want to drive it at 100 milliamps, that's more than the pick can do, I need an amplifier or buffer. That's the transistor. The first step is to design the collector side so that when the switch closes, this goes to zero volts, or actually for a TIP transistor, this saturates at 0.9 volts. Uh, when that switch closes, I want 100 milliamps to flow, or one amp to flow. Um, so that would be 10 volts, minus three volts across the LED, minus 0.9 volts across the transistor, leave 6.1 volts across the resistor. 6.1 volts at one amp is 6.1 ohms. Set RC to 6.1 ohms. To saturate it, I want to make sure that the current that I allow, beta IB, is more than one amp. Uh, for this case, the TIP transistor has a gain of 1,000. If IC is a uh, one amp, this is one milliamp. So make sure the base current is at least one milliamp. To be safe, I'll make it two milliamps. Again, I want beta IB to be more than IC, and not just a hair more. I want it to be like double. So let's pick this to be two milliamps. RB then is just the voltage drop. Uh, 1.4 volts based emitter for a TIP transistor. Five volts from the pick gives you 3.6 volts. 3.6 volts at two milliamps, it gives you 1800 ohms. So let's illustrate how that works. This is a one watt LED. I've connected 12 ohms to it. If I connect it across five volts, I will first want to make sure the LED works. So I connect it five volts to ground, and uh, yep, I got a good LED. If it doesn't work, connect it directly to power, nothing's going to work. So now let's connect it to the TIP transistor. 
and uh, get the pinouts, go to DigiKey. Maybe. There we are. Go to DigiKey and you can see the pinouts. The pin one is the base, pin three is the emitter, pin two is the collector. So once you get the pinouts, I can see that here's the base, there's the emitter, and notice I color coded it so black is ground. That goes to ground over here on your board. And let's see, this guy goes to here. The LED goes to the collector. And so there the LEDs on, LEDs off, LEDs on, LEDs off. The pick can turn it on and off. And if you want to verify that it's working, I would measure the voltage at the collector right here. The saturation voltage comes from the data sheets. This one, when you saturate, is 0.9 volts. If I measure this voltage and get about 0.9, it's working, the transistor saturating. If it's more than 0.9, say 2.2 volts, I don't have enough current in the base. I need a smaller resistor to get more base current. If it's less than 0.9, well, that's good. That just means it's a really good switch. So here's a challenge for you. I now have a switch. I can turn the LED full on or full off with 0 volts, 5 volts. Suppose I want the LED to be, LED to be 20% on. What do I do? Well, that depends upon the class you're taking. In electronics, what I would do is I would change the resistor. Make this four times bigger, I'll get less current. Less current means less brightness. That's the hardware solution. Anything I can do in hardware, I can do in software. What I can do in software is vary the duty cycle. If instead of the LED being on all the time, if it's only on for 20% of the time, it looks like it's 20% as bright. And just make this really, really fast, fl uh, flashing. The LED is actually flickering, but if you can't see it, it looks like it's just dimmer. And software, what I would do is something like this, have a wait loop. I'll have it turn off, that's clearing port C, for three counts, turn it on for one count, off for three, on for one, that's 25% on. Make this off for four counts, on for one, that's 20% on, and so on. By varying the wait time, I can vary this off time. That'll vary the brightness. That's called pulse width modulation. That's a way to vary the brightness in software. So another thing you can do for a homework project is build an LED flashlight where the push buttons vary how bright the LED is. And by doing that, I'll have each button vary the wait time down here. What that looks like in terms of the LEDs is something like this. This is actually the LEDs on your board. Uh, the hardware hasn't changed. These resistors set the brightness when it's full on. The software varies the brightness. Here, port A is 0% on, port B is 5% on, port C is 20% on, and port D is 90% on. By varying the on time, it looks like the LEDs have varied in brightness. That's the software solution. And that concludes lecture number six for ECE 376, LEDs.